Would you please welcome Marsha Gesson? Thank you very much for coming. We have a lot to talk about. I want to talk about Putin shortly. But first, I was fascinated when you tweeted this upon arriving in the country. Well, the last time I was spoken to the way I just was by the Australian customs officer was by the Russian police. And then the head of Border Force asked you to DM him, send a direct message to discuss what went down. That like, I've got to say, amazing. I think Border Force would be wrapped to be compared to the Russian police. <laughs> that is, a, you know, they're real tough guys now. Um, so, today, I actually got a message from them saying that they had conducted an investigation and it wasn't them, it was an agricultural control or whatever. In, in the States, we call, we call all of that customs. Yes. So, but what, it was just an angry farmer? Was it like... <laughs> So, so what did they actually do at the airport? What, what happened? You know, it was very strange. This guy uh, who was checking my, my, my luggage, I, I, I travelled with a folding bike. And uh, I pack it with my clothes, so it's pretty clean. But when he lifted the mud flap, he saw that there was a little bit of dirt on the inside of the mud flap of my bike. And then he had this whole humiliation routine going. Yeah, he made me read my landing card out loud. What? Like, line by line. And not until I admitted that I had been wrong to not declare my bicycle as, as a soiled thing, a thing <laughs> so, with soil on it, uh, he wouldn't let me go. It was, it, was, it was a very bizarre experience, and it was clearly not the first time he'd done this. Yeah, it's a good thing you didn't try to bring in fruit, because you probably would have been executed. <laughs> <laughs> you were fired uh, for refusing to report on Vladimir Putin hang gliding with birds. <laughs> I don't know anyone else who has been fired for not reporting on Vladimir Putin hang gliding with birds. This is probably true. Yes. Probably. Uh, <laughs> see, the, the interesting part of that story is not actually my getting fired for, uh, for refusing to report on it. The interesting part was that Putin called me after I got fired and said that he heard that it was my fault and I thought it was a prank. So I kept trying to figure out something smart to say to him <laughs> because I knew it was going to end up on YouTube. <laughs> and, um, and he kept talking, and I thought, this guy... And this was after I'd written a book about Putin, so I thought, this guy is, like, amazing. It's like he spent <laughs> as much time in Putin's brain as I have. <laughs> and so he rang, and you eventually met him. I did. What was he like? Like, because he feels to me like a genuine Bond villain, like a fictional character. Well, and that's what I thought. And it, it was especially easy for me to think that because I'd written a book about him, so I felt like I'd written this character. <laughs> And I was very excited about meeting him because I thought, well, maybe he'd come alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a very good author. If you created <laughs> right, modern exactly. Russia, that is brilliant. <laughs> I thought maybe he'd be more interesting than the guy I wrote. Because the guy I wrote was kind of two-dimensional, uh, kind of cardboardy, and, um, and that's exactly how he was in life. Part of me kind of wanted to be charmed by him, and, uh, because some people have been. He, you know, the guy was trained to be a KGB recruiter. He's supposed to charm people. But none of that came across. He, he, was, he was very wooden. In Australia, if we don't like a leader, it'll be 18 months, we'll have another one. But <laughs> in Russia, that's not the deal. If you didn't like Stalin, you were stuck with Stalin for a long time. And I get the feeling Putin has no plan on leaving. Um, no, he, it's, it, he, he plans to die in office. And he doesn't plan to die at all. I'm convinced he thinks he's immortal. Well, that just doesn't so... make any sense, those two <laughs> things. Um, well, Russia is a little bit like that. It's it can be kind of <laughs> contradictory. But, yeah, I mean, he's, he's engineered it so that he will be... He's been running Russia for 16 years now, right? I mean, that's a whole generation of people who've grown up knowing of no other leader, uh, even as a possibility, than Putin. He can run for re-election again in, seven, in 2018 uh, for another six years. By the time he's done with that term, uh, he will be 74. And uh, what makes me really sad is that I won't be much younger. <laughs> and, um, and I don't think, uh, you know, he'll figure out a way uh, to, to stay on longer. I'm not actually convinced that he's eternal. I think that eventually the regime that he, he has created will implode, but there's no way to tell when it's going to implode. It's funny, you're very comfortable laughing about Putin, but at the same time, you, you no longer live in Russia, largely because of their well, they're anti-gay laws. Do you feel like he is genuinely dangerous? Yes, I think he's dangerous to Russia, to the people who live in Russia, uh, not just to those who are opposed to him, although terrible things have happened to the, some of the people who are opposed to him. They have been killed. They have been in prison for many, many years at a time. Um, I think he's dangerous to the world. I mean, he is intent on destabilising the world as we know it. 
The war in Ukraine uh, is part of that. His involvement in Syria is part of that. The fact that he has blackmailed the United States into sitting down with him to negotiate on Syria is part of that. His support for the far right in Europe, which is really destabilizing that entire continent, is part of that. Reading your book, I got a genuine sense that you felt the investigation into the Boston bombings was, was incomplete, but the story was told to the public that, that it, it was complete. And it made me wonder if you think that the government of Russia and the government of America are really so different. You know, I think that uh, I try not to make those kinds of comparisons just because I think they're actually different beasts. Uh, there is a major difference between a country that has a very flawed democracy and a country that doesn't have any democratic institutions whatsoever, which is what Russia is. But I think that every any time you have somebody in uniform who has unchecked power, uh, you end up with pretty much the same thing. Even, you know, even if it's an agriculture officer on the border, <laughs> uh, on the Australian border. But, you know, what happened with the investigation to the Boston Marathon bombing was that the FBI couldn't produce any information on where the bombs were made. And so that means we don't know who else was involved, if there was somebody else involved. And even, you know, marginally, someone else had to be involved because at least someone had to, ha to own the space or provide them with the space to make the bombs, whether wittingly or unwittingly. That's a huge thing to not know. That's fairly typical for FBI investigations. The only way that you can deal with that is if you have a civilian oversight agency that calls the FBI to account. That's what we have to, uh, had after 9-11. We had this amazing Senate investigation that was later published as a book that was actually nominated for the National Book Award. It was a finalist for the National Book Award, and it's great reading. Uh, in the case of the Boston Marathon bombing, there was a congressional investigation that lasted, I think, all of three, three days. They went to Chechnya and held a press conference hosted by Stephen Siegel. Uh, <laughs> Which is when you Stephen know, Siegel. yeah, you need, you need to take it seriously at that moment. <laughs> exactly. I don't think anybody was laughing in that room. Um, and they published a report that contained less information than was publicly available in the media. So if they can't step up and hold the FBI to account, nobody's going to. Your, your new book, The Sanayo Brothers, looks at the lives of the Boston Marathon bombers Tamerlan and Jahat Sanayev. Why did they do it? Well, that's... Why not? Uh, and, you know, I'm not trying to be funny, obviously. Uh, one of the problems that we have when we try to think about terrorism is we think it's completely inconceivable. So there has to be some huge explanation out there, unlike the explanation for any other violent crime. In fact, terrorism is like other violent crimes. The kind of people who commit acts of terror are not less than human or more than human. All the terrorism scholarship tells us that they're psychologically, they're perfectly normal. They follow a particular kind of logic that ultimately leads them to this decision, which in their universe is rational. Because we want to believe, don't we, that there is some magic that makes them do it, like a Pied Piper of evil sing, plays exactly. a song into their ear and takes away otherwise good, good people to participate. Exactly. The whole radicalization story is about that. You know, there is something as huge out there as the fear that terrorism inspires in us. And that huge thing recruits innocent men and takes them through their paces and then finally they land at radicalization and, and, um, and terrorism. But in fact, radical beliefs aren't even a predictor of terrorist behavior. Most people who have radical beliefs never commit an act of terrorism. So what was it then with, with these two brothers? What was that final step to, to turn it to action? There's something incredibly seductive about terrorism, and the war on terror has a lot to do with it. Uh, terrorism is an option for somebody who feels like a nobody to belong to something greater. And to go straight from being you know, a nobody in a country that doesn't see you to somebody who can declare war in a great power. And the great power accepts your declaration of war. It treats you as an enemy combatant instead of treating you as a common criminal. Now, in, in researching the book, you, you considered building a bomb the way that they did. I did, actually. That's some serious research. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I was stuck in reporting because I asked uh, a number of experts whether they would have been able to build the bomb the way that the prosecution said they did, following a recipe that was called how to build a bomb in the kitchen of your mom. It sounds delightful. Uh, I know, and um, and sort of homey, right? And, um, <laughs> and they... what what sort of gingham apron do you choose for that sort of bomb? <laughs> exactly. So, uh, my best friend was Facebook messaging me, and she she messaged, "I think you should build a bomb." 
I was like, I think you should stop writing to me. <laughs> <laughs> so what finally stopped me was not just the idea that somebody was, was probably reading our Facebook, mes uh, Facebook messaging, but also then, then I would have to test the bomb to see if it actually worked. And that's very hard. A, a test of a bomb looks remarkably just like detonating a bomb, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I was afraid of. <laughs> the book is great. It's called The Sanayev Brothers. Uh, would you please thank Marsha Gessen. Thank you. Thank you.